Hello everyone and welcome to VWEC's Expert Series. I'm Brayla Jean-Viev and today we will be presenting a model of teaching panel um, who will be presenting strategies for teaching in virtual worlds. And before we get, begin, please note that our presentation today will be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. So we ask that you please turn off your mic during the presentation until we have our Q&A session. The VWEC YouTube channel can be found at the link in local chat. And I do have a late edition here. This is our live streaming chat as well, so if you wish to live stream on YouTube, that's your connect. So when you check out YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the VWEC channel to be notified of all the excellent content that is continually being added there. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to tell you a little bit about VWECs. Let me catch up with my speakeasy, I'm so sorry. I'd like to tell you a little bit about VWEC's Modules of Teaching. The Modules of Teaching exhibit is located here at the Eduverse Plaza, and I've gone ahead and sent you a link to that, a slur for that. Expert instructors, including our panel today, who have used virtual worlds as a technology to teach their classes, have created this exhibit to share their approaches and why they chose that approach. These classroom experiences are diverse in content and include K-12, higher ed, and eventually lifelong learning instructors. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Our first guest today is Zinnia Zaber, who is Renee Excuse me. Our first guest today is Zinnia Zauber, who is Renee Amico Brock, a professor at Peninsula College. She is an artist, instructor, and superhero, empowering people to be at their best virtual and tangible self. Renee has taught college level fine arts and digital media since 1997 and started teaching in virtual worlds in 2008. Renee earned her Bachelor's of Science in Art at Lewis and Clark College and her Master's of Fine Arts at Vermont College in Fine Arts at Norwich University and is the 2020 recipient of the VWPEE Thinker Award. So, welcome Zinnia. Our second speaker today is going to be Mehdi Martian, who is Dr. Eric Moore, the Executive Director over Cybersecurity and Data Centers at a large suburban school district. He teaches cybersecurity at the graduate level at Regis University in Denver and is editor-in-chief at the Journal of the Colloquium for Information Systems Security Education and chair of the IFIP World Information Security Conference. His 3D education builds in virtual worlds have supported higher education and K-12 programs within the U.S. and abroad. While his PhD is in cybersecurity and he holds a master's degree in telecommunications, his first graduate degree is a master of fine arts, working as a professor of fine arts for about 10 years, teaching commercial and fine arts in both digital and traditional media. His peer-reviewed cybersecurity research works to understand and enhance the lives of those who work, learn, and live in cyberspace with an emphasis on cyber defense teams. Welcome, Eric, today. Thanks very much, Brayla. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Our next speaker today will be Matt, Max Chat Noir. Let me get my get caught up here. <laughs> Max Chat Noir is Dr. Marianne Clark, a retired biology instructor at Texas Wesleyan University, who manages Genome Island in Second Life. She taught biology for about 50 years and came into Second Life in 2004 looking for an immersive place to teach biology online. She had little experience in programming and no experience in building. Starting with a small parcel on the Second Life mainland, she eventually moved to what is now Genome Island. She moved her online non-majors course to Second Life in 2007 and soon as her as soon as her university got computers that could run the browser. And she encourages other educators to take advantage of virtual worlds for teaching. Welcome, Max. 
Piona Destiny is Dr. Doris Malero, a language professor at Universidad San Pablo, Tucumán. She has been developing ways of teaching English and Spanish for more than 30 years. Doris is passionate about language learning, instructional design, and related educational technologies, specifically multi-user virtual environments for situated experiential learning. She's part of Webheads in Action and TESOL, both important worldwide communities of language language educators. She has been part of the Virtual World's MOOC and Evo Village online training sessions as a moderator, creating courses for English teachers in Second Life and Kitely. This year, they also explored VR platforms such as Frame VR, Mozilla Hubs, and Altspace VR. And she is the recipient of the 2022 VWPBPE Thinker Award. Welcome, Peonia. Thank you. Happy to be here. Besitos. <laughs> and then finally, Kaylee West is Dr. Scott Grant, a lecturer in Chinese language and culture at Monash University and creator of the Chinese Island Immersive Learning Environment in Second Life. You can find her in the universes of OpenSim, Defiance, Star Citizen, Tom Clancy's The Division, Arma 3, and VR Chat. She's particularly interested in the use of digital technology and ICT to enhance learner experiences. Her current focus is on virtual worlds, VR and AR, and developing educational simulations that complement more traditional cur curriculum, both classroom-based and online. Her PhD thesis is called Getting Immersed in Chinese Task-Based Language, Learning in a 3D World Simulation. Kaylee very much wanted to be here today, but she is in Australia, and so she's unable to join us. However, she's been extremely helpful to us as we've set up, and she is sending us information with you. Uh, she has a video available with more details that is at the Mo Models of Learning Center, and she sent us a presentation that I will be sharing with you. So with that, Zinnia, if you would like to go ahead and begin. Yes, thank you. So I am trying to advance my slides and these slides and see if I can find mine um, because you all know how I have to make things pretty. Um, thank you so much for having me today and this opportunity to be showcased with a number of wonderful profession professionals. We um, all work in very different ways and so I don't see my slides so I'm I see a lot of other ones, so I will start <laughs> with what I was going to say. So I'm using the speakeasy as my script as well. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing this part, but I'm sure you all know the lyrics of Pure Imagination. So I make technology accessible and teach art to facilitate inquiry, innovation, and exploration. My courses are listed as multimedia communications and art, and yet I teach teamwork, confidence, creativity, and a bit of physics and philosophy. Which means I guide students to use their imagination to produce inspiring content and develop persuasive and visually attractive media that communicates information, welcomes engagement, and educates. Oh, thank you for putting up the slide for me. Yay. At Peninsula College, I am the Multimedia Communications Program Coordinator as well as the Business and Information Technology Division Chair, which means I get to teach students from all different forms of pursuits and interests. My Peninsula College students live all over the world and we are online and on campus. We have had online education degree seekers for over two decades. I live in a pretty remote location on the Olympic Peninsula near the most northwest spot in the state of Washington. The moment I finally got high speed internet, I signed up for Second Life to expand my reach and the opportunity to learn a new set of skills. I bet a bunch of you did that too. Yes, I am lucky that my college administrators supported me in teaching this virtual education environment. I've had amazing campus IT team and stellar students who advocate to learn in the future. Playing is learning. I build complex layered learning systems that provide a map, itinerary, set of clear guidelines and outcomes, call to action, and visual language. Let me see. 
I can, oh, there we go. There's a good example of a couple of those systems. To make these complex ideas accessible, and they are pretty, playful, and colorful, and very brain bright. Content creation and curation in virtual worlds ties into every skill set that my students explore, like Photoshop, video production, 3D building, digital storytelling, and those soft skills like working with clients and presenting projects. Students work as teams and the low cost and low risk makes them courageous. Working in virtual worlds has also given them access to other instructors and students for teaching and learning experiences. And because it's my students, they will do the teaching. <laughs> A little bit about the exhibit that you will explore. And let me switch back here. Awesome. To find your difference with the Lodestar Compass model exhibit, it encourages the learner to do what they love. Limitless ambition essentials include a Lodestar, your passion, compassion, your passion compass that you use as your unique guide and as a point of navigation. So originally when I was going to do this, I was dressed in red to be your red arrow pointer on the compass. And then we realized I was going to blend into the carpet too much. So <laughs> I changed my outfit. So I hope that it still allows you to guide, be guided. To motivate students and colleagues to define and refine their own pursuits and interests as an imperative goal pointer within this extraordinary educational directive and journey. So, so much of what I do is to develop spaces so that students can explore and use their skills and build up their skills. Lodestar also embraces persuasive storytelling and effective communication with an influential introduction, challenge, and resolution to articulate unconventional and exceptional job skills. Immersive environments provide occupational navigation practice and fortitude. Discover and use your own Lodestar. It provides transformational experience to boost communication and to reveal motivation to place people with you to, to where you want to work with and who and in those roles that you love and offer them unlimited energy and purpose. I suspect a lot of you also realize how virtual worlds are a transformative experience for our students. Do you agree? Through the Lodestar lesson, you can define what you love, explore our objectives to define your purpose, to fuel up for your drive that gives you energy, to express what you enjoy as you are fully engaged, to communicate these storytelling elements, to share skills and accomplishments. You can define your situation, and this is your observed and explained status. The task is the mission at hand, and action is the effort and achievements. The result is the ideal outcome. Some of you may have explored builds or other uh, presentations of my coursework. and how I motivate students by learning more and giving them a mission to support others. The Superheroes Journey, which is a new student orientation and digital storytelling interactive project, is ongoing persistent engagement experience that inform and inspire new students. My students design, build, and institute components of this superheroes journey. The continual goal of the project is to build an innovative marketing space and introduce to, the, to students what college is through this adventure. Throughout the creative production and iterative design learning systems, these steps are to play, discover, document, design, develop, deploy, update, and reflect, and to have students work together. And sometimes they need to repeat and re these things to make it better. A sense of space creates a sense of belonging. 
open exploration is wonderful and providing them a pathway assures them that they will find their way. Students want to contribute. Virtual worlds provide a path away from the ordinary to the extraordinary. What will you discover on our pathway? And I'll stop there so I can let some other people share their stuff too. Thank you so much, Zania. That was outstanding, really interesting, very colorful. <laughs> Mehdi, if you would like to go ahead and continue. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, uh, uh, Zinia, I really uh, appreciated the involvement of your students and the uh, uh, the way you use the graphics. I think I need to work on that in my own work. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, show it here. This is a, a virtual world data center. You can see me standing there for a sense of scale. And um, what I'm doing is um, offering students the ability to experience a professional role. And the professional role here is as a physical security auditor. So students will uh, come to the virtual data center. This is at Vertex. So if they're uh, down on the surface, they can take the teleport up and then follow the arrows they get here. And then they read the signs for what are their responsibilities and requirements. This um, exercise is used at different schools. So uh, the professor may have different requirements for the students but how they actually do the work are listed on these placards here in front. Once they have that, then behind them is this scenario space surrounded by the blue wall. It's the building, but it's also the surrounding space. Students have to go in and identify what's wrong with the space, what could be improved, what are security risks. And uh, as we deal with virtual worlds, the reason this was done in a virtual world is because 9-11 occurred and uh, so this was actually built quite a long time ago. And uh, when that happened, I had been giving tours and other people had too of uh, data centers for their students to uh, do physical security auditing live to say, you know, what's, where are the security flaws in this data center? How could they improve access controls? Do they have operation security? Are they uh, protecting their data and processes? And are they protecting the uh, data on the servers and drives and things like that physically as they should? So there's a lot of things going on here that we can see. Initially, uh, you can't see really close in these diagrams, but if you look, there's a little payphone near the stairs there on the lower left in the front door or next to the front door. Well, having a payphone next to a front door of a secure installation is just ask, giving a person an excuse to come up and loiter near your security entrance. And so this would be one type of thing that the students would need to find. But it's really not about things, and it's not about words so much, and it's also not about just a particular view. But physical security auditing is particularly three-dimensional. It's a spatial skill. It's like as you walk up the steps, can you recognize that the proximity of the phone next to the um, stairs and the entrance is inappropriate. Hey, I just realized, and I'm sorry about this, but I forgot to share the link to the um, auto text chat. So let me go ahead and put that uh, in the chat here so you can have that for this presentation. Hopefully that will work. Uh, now, uh, as, as we're looking a little closer at this uh, scale, we can see that there are other buildings around there and maybe shipping containers behind it. Students will discover that learning about what is around your data center can equally affect your security. So they have to take a walk like any physical security auditor would. When they're doing this, they really get the experience and they have to define two um, columns. One is, what would the security risk be? And the second one is, how would you correct that risk? While the students don't necessarily have a great deal of experience at answering these types of questions, 
it gives them the sense for what the responsibilities would be in the role and what types of things they can start to uncover. And then in their class, when they debrief, then they can uh, review this, they can compare with other students and uh, see what's happening. This is the entrance. And uh, as you can see here, immediately there is a, a staff directory right on the desk as you walk in. Uh, and well, while, while the staff directory is a good thing, the um, having it sit on the front desk is not necessarily mm -hmm. a good thing. So uh, students can uh, see the um, uh, staff directory there, but then they should be also thinking something like, "What? What is the? Uh, what could happen if the staff directory is sitting there? What kind of scenario can occur that might incur risk?" This particular um, uh, form here, this uh, person sitting behind the desk, is not an avatar. Uh, we don't have it set up as a chat bot right now because the facility just moved, but you can also chat with some of the um, characters in the scene so that you can uh, get a sense for what's going on there. And uh, then also you see there's a metal detector. Is this the right place for the metal detector? Should there be some sort of other um, entryway, something like that? But uh, it's a way of confirming uh, the people going into the computer rooms of the data center. Um, you can see there's a copy machine and other things like that around that all come into question. Should people be looking at the uh, video of the security cameras or should they not? There aren't necessary. I mean, there are some really obvious things, but there are a lot of physical security auditing questions that are ambiguous. And so having the students role play this out provides a rich environment that's now, because of higher security requirements, difficult to actually provide to the students in a real world scenario. And yet doing this, they still get the same spatial recognition, spatial pattern identification, and other things like that. So um, if you uh, want to uh, go visit this site, you can uh, go over to the uh, model build on this sim, and there's a, a link to the uh, landmark so that you could go visit the site over at Vertec. All right, thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was really cool. I would love to go see that. Max, would you like to join us? I would. And I'm going to be pasting some text in here as I go, and I will try not to get too confusing about it. So I think that many of you know that what first brought me into Second Life was playing World of Warcraft with my husband, who was a, a, um, an intrepid gamer. Um, and when I played that game with him, I discovered how how, how uh, educational those environments were. You had to learn how to do stuff in order to play the game. And so that's that's how I got into Second Life to begin with, and found that oh, I can I can build stuff here. I could build laboratories and stuff. So the structure of Genome Island, which is where I taught my non-majors genetics course for 14 years, is meant to be kind of a virtual laboratory where students can run experiments and test various hypotheses um, about genetics or to see how you know a lot of the principles of genetics have emerged. Uh, the island is open access, so students from any place can, uh, can come in and use it. Um, and this next part is where I should have learned something from Zinnia, but I didn't. So I'm just going to leave it right where it is and tell you a little bit about the structure of the island. So there are several regions, and each of the regions is associated with a particular aspect 
of genetics. Um, in Mendel's Abbey and the Associated Gardens, uh, these help students to learn the Mendelian laws. They can do different experiments, and we'll see one of those in a little while. Um, and then in the outlying regions, like the Cattery and some of the other places that are near the Abbey, there are extensions to the Mendelian laws. Um, in the tower is most of the molecular genetics, including information on uh, gene and chromosome structure, information and experiments on gene and chromosome structure. There is a bioinformatics platform where we can do historical genetics and bioinformatics. And um, in the, there are a bunch of galleries for both prokaryotic and eukaryotic and organeller genomes. And uh, those are informational resources for various, uh, various prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes. And then finally, there are a lot of places on the island where you can meet. And one place where I often start out is at this Abbey conference table that you can see in the slide there. And this... Um, I usually use this for the orientation session, which is the only time I really meet directly with the students as a single group. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in and out of the island a lot, just kind of keeping up with their work and answering questions and so forth. But for orientation, uh, I get to get, get the students together in several small groups uh, and make sure they, they knew how to get around the island and how to interact with the objects and that sort of thing. So there are three kinds of um, exhibits around the island. Some of them are just, uh, well, some of them are just are these meeting places. In fact, if you look through the door, you can see, you can possibly just see another little, little table that's way down at the end by, uh, by the gene pool. And so there are several other uh, meeting places, and they're all out of uh, chat range with one another, so that several several groups can meet at the same time on the island. The Human Chromosome Gallery is an example of some of the informational uh, some of the informational exhibits on Second Life. So these chromosomes are all to scale. That is, that's the, the, the relative sizes of the chromosomes are the real relative sizes, except for the mitochondrial genome, which is that circle that you see in the back. That is, of course, much bigger. But all the other chromosomes are, uh, are modeled to scale. And each of the chromosomes will tell you something about itself. It will give you its size and, and uh, how many genes it has uh, so that students can calculate the gene densities. Each of the chromosomes also talks about one of the genes that is on the chromosome. Um, and that, uh, that is explained in a note card that you get if you click on the chromosome. And then the arrows that you see on the different chromosomes show the location of the gene that is described for that chromosome. So this is just information. There aren't any real experiments that are involved in this particular display. And the, uh, the various genomes are similar. They'll tell you something about a particular genome, dog, cat, horse, um, or various kinds of bacteria and so forth. So this is, this is just, um, just an informational resource. A lot of the exhibits on Genome Island are interactive and allow students to, uh, to run experiments and so they can see uh, the kind of thing that they would see if they were doing uh, live experiments in a laboratory. The advantage of doing them um, in, in this um, the advantage of doing them as, as a simulation is that you don't have to wait for two weeks for the flies to hatch or nine weeks for the kittens to get born or any of those things. You can see the, uh, the results of the experiments right away. 
And for example, this is uh, this is an experiment from the Dot Hybrid Garden, and um, there are um, two different kinds of uh, of genes represented here, uh, one for height and one for color, and so you can get tall red, short red, tall white, and short white, and uh, the numbers beside each of the pictures, each of the pictures shows you a possible result of uh, clicking on the garden and getting a population of these flowers. Um, and the predicted numbers are 93 to 3 to 1, 9 tall red to 3 short red to 3 tall white to 1 short white. And as you can see, uh, you never get just exactly that with a single progeny set. If you run a lot of progeny sets and then you take the average of them, you get much closer to those predicted numbers, uh, which shows the importance of getting large, large data numbers for, for doing data analysis. Uh, let me just, I'm just going to put something else in the chat record here. Okay. So this is another example of, uh oh, oh, what happened? There it is. Um, this is actually one of the one of the uh, interactive objects that's on display in the uh, in the in the learning model center here on Edgeverse. And uh, this is about blood typing. This is an example of one of those things that don't quite follow the Mendelian laws because there are there aren't just two possible uh, blood types. There are three possible blood types, and two of them are dominant to the other one. Um, and so, what you have here on this table is uh, the progeny of four possible mothers. Uh, the mother, the blood type of the mothers is shown in the circles on each of the posters. So we have a type O mother, a type A mother, a type B mother, and a type AB mother. Um, and if you click on any of these posters, you will get possible progeny that this mother could produce, depending, of course, on who the father was. So from uh, and, and then uh, you click on these slides and you run a blood typing test. And uh, so you can see what the blood types are for the progeny. Um, and this poster up here the back, up, up above the table, shows how to read the, read the tests. And so you get blood types for the progeny and you have the blood type from the mother. And so the task is to figure out what the blood type of the father might have been. And there are several different sets of progeny that can be, that can be produced from each of the mothers. Um, and in some cases, the father may be more than one possible blood type. But I just ask the students to pick any possible paternal blood type. And then they have to figure out what the genotypes of the mother and the father and all of the progeny are from the data that they have here. So there's a lot of uh, this this activity can can take a while to work all the way through it. So the other activity that is in the uh, teaching models exhibit is the cataract which is uh, actually another example of uh, divergence from uh, the, the simple Mendelian laws. Because this one, uh, the cattery shows you about uh, six linked genes. So in the, in the exhibit, um, there are, uh, there's are videos which uh, take students around the table. And you are welcome to, of course, uh, go and look at that any time. Uh, and there are also uh, some information about other, other aspects of the island. And I think I will just uh, stop there and pass it on to Fionia. Thank you so much, Max. Fionia, you're up.
Thanks, Max. Wow. Well, as you can see, lots of experiences and lots of really good things can be done in virtual worlds. So to tell you a little bit about my experience and how I got here, well, that was back in 2006, thanks to uh, web heads in actions. They used to be very enthusiastic and have a, a, a center in, in Second Life. But at that time, I didn't have a good computer or connection or anything. So I had to wait until 2009. And then the first thing that I, I got the chance to explore was role playing in a fantasy sim. So for a, a language teacher that was like, wow, you know, this is a great way to teach. So First, uh, I'm telling you that it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you about our, one of our adventures that is virtually anywhere in Second Life. is a way to show you how uh, virtual worlds and transmedia storytelling can be used to teach language. I am honored to share our experiences here. And um, I want to thank BWEC and you all for having me here for listening to our story. And uh, in the next few minutes, I'll talk about my research and practice and in integrating transmedia and storytelling in virtual worlds to teach and learn English in my online classes and with my students. So thanks again. And I look forward to a great discussion after this. Mm hmm. Okay. So, um, let me get started by telling you about our project. Virtually Anywhere is a transmedia experience that uses storytelling to help students to uh, learn English. <laughs> students collaborate to create new stories. I don't know if my speakeasy is working. Is it? Okay. Uh huh. But I don't see it's changing. Oh, it goes slow. So, um, here we are. So, um, The storyline uh, used for this project is a part of an audio series by Cambridge Assessment English. And these uh, audio episodes were created to help students improve their English listening skills. So basically, it's just audio telling you stories. Okay, and this is a really exciting uh, story. So I got the idea of using it for, you know, creating the scenes in, in Second Life and having the students walk the story and interact with the story or get the chance to understand much better. Um, the series tells the story of Gita and Paul, two university students who are studying archaeology and they are struggling with their coursework when a mysterious professor offers to help them. The professor takes them on a series of virtual trips to different archaeological sites. So as you can see here in Second Life, uh, teleporting to different places is just fun. So it's like, oh, this is just perfect for a virtual world. So this is what we did. Uh, here, I'm going to share a link to a video. Oh, sorry, that's not the one. Uh, so you can watch. Uh, when you have the time, not now, but later, you can watch what virtually uh, anywhere is like and what uh, the audio seri uh, series sounds like and how that inspired this little project that I have with my students. Um, okay, so we move here and we move here. In the, in the original series, uh, the characters visit two sites, the Terracotta Army in China and the Citadel of Teotihuacan in Mexico. And students created two new episodes based on, on the originals. 
But visiting these two places gave us uh, the chance to explore, to learn about these uh, historical sites. Students didn't know much about it. So it was a, a, a way to explore and learn and discover new things. Since the students were from different countries, they decided to set their stories in their home countries. So students in Argentina chose Pucara de Tilcara. This is a, um, a fortress. It's not a fortress. It's like, yes, it's kind of a fortress in the province of Jujuy. And students in Germany chose the Imperial Palace of Goslar. Um, so they get the chance to show some of their uh, culture, talk about their experiences and visiting those places. Mm. No, I'm late on the... I'm having trouble with my speakeasy. Okay, this is where we are now. Uh, there are seven episodes in this ongoing project. It is an ongoing project because we're still working with this. The original group of students that started uh, with the project um, left their work and that work is shared by the new group of students that arrive. Um, let me see if I can share. So you can visit virtually anywhere in Second Life. And as you can see, we had seven uh, episodes. Uh, they are completed in Second Life. And um, the final, pro the final uh, episode is not there yet because we are uh, waiting for what else happens, OK? What, more, uh, what other adventures are Paul, Gita, and the professor going to go on? So. Um, here you got the episode number two that's professor machine uh, the professor's machine that's where this the students get to start traveling and then they go to the first uh, destination that was the terracotta army next they go and visit the emperor's tomb they go to teotihuacan in mexico they visit the feather serpent temple and this is where the students created their own episode when they went to visit the Imperial Palace of Goslar. Uh, also, they went to the Pucara of Tilcara and as you can see episode six, uh, 7 is coming soon. This project includes virtual worlds where students can visit the sites involving the storyline of virtually anywhere. Also, students participate in a series of short presentations in the sites in both Second Life and in, in the virtual uh, platform uh, soon. These presentations were given by different educators located in different countries. As my this project started during COVID. So there was a perfect time for people to be at the computer and to be online. So there was no excuse not to, to participate. And they, I had a chance to uh, invite teachers from the countries where these sites are at. And for example, here we got uh, Michelle Wan, a mini. She's from China. And she told us about the Terracotta Army and the Emperor's Tomb. At the same time, uh, we used this experience to for our Virtual World MOOC uh, sessions. And uh, she came and she told us about uh, stories and music and poetry. Uh, at that time, she uh, performed because she can play this instrument from China. So as you can see, the possibilities of, of learning and about culture and, and experience learning in a different way were just amazing. Also, uh, Ang Novak, 
uh, she is uh, from Germany and she told us about the Imperial Palace of Goslar. The good thing about uh, having Anne tell us all is because uh, if you go into the palace, you will see a lot of uh, pictures that depict uh, historic moments of, you know, the German history. So she was able to tell us and explain the, what was happening in those scenes. And also, we had a chance to uh, play a game there because you can, once you are there, first you had to find a key to get into the, the palace. And next, you had to uh, uh, escape the room task where you had to find Henry III's heart. It is very interesting to know that even though there is a sarcophagus and you're supposed to have the whole body there, it, there, there is only the heart. Uh, in the uh, Palace of Gosler, you can only find Henry's heart. And for our uh, activity, it was lost and a student had to find it. Also, uh, we invited a Eugenia Calderón from Mexico. She's a long time maestra of Spanish here in Second Life. And she told us about the citadel of Teotihuacan. We learned about the Aztecs and uh, many interesting things. Also, um, I forgot about the speakeasy, sorry. So that's Michelle, Minnie. The interesting thing about Minnie is that she was in China, so it was like she couldn't get, uh, get to Second Life. So it was like we started talking through chat uh, with this Chinese uh, uh, application, and I, I created an avatar for her. So she was, uh, her avatar was here, and it performed playing the music, but she was in Zoom because she couldn't get to Second Life. Um, okay. Next, we have Gabriel Estrada. Since our, my students, most of my students were in, in art in Argentina, uh, they uh, recreated uh, an episode in Pucara de Tilcara. So, uh, Gabriela. Gabriela was is a, a teacher that lives in a small town, and she has never had uh, she have never done something like this before, presented to uh, uh, you know in a conference. So for her, it was her first experience, and she did a great job telling us about the culture and the carnival and the food and all the things that are uh, nearby Pucara de Tilcara. Tilcara is a little town in Jujuy. Uh, also, again, we have, we use a little bit of gamification because it's exciting just not to go there and look at pictures, but to do things. Uh, we included some elements of gamification by um, including escape the room task to make it fun for visitors to our tour uh, virtually anywhere adventure to our virtually anywhere adventure uh, there there are some doors that won't open unless you find a key so if you are going to visit this uh, uh, scenes these episodes make sure that you you know you know <laughs> you have to find a key if you don't find a key you won't be able to get in and see what's going on inside um okay so to wrap up and to finish um Uh, to wrap up and look at the benefit of designing transmedia projects like Virtually Anywhere in Second Life show that the creation of such a story in virtual worlds can be used for the fulfillment of educational goals and support the implementation of strategies that combine effective storytelling with transmedia techniques. They reach out to learners on their terms, creating, enhancing and spreading content in a rich and fruitful way. The way uh, uh, my students, not all of them could come into Second Life, so most of the interactions were through Zoom, 
But all this material creating us these uh, scenes help them understand better the story and be able to create new ones. Uh, we also uh, created a graphic novel with the episodes and included vocabulary and comprehension exercises. Those comprehension exercises are the ones that you will find in each of the episodes. Uh, so what I do is I will use this, the Second Life through Zoom and uh, use the materials in Zoom to have a class, to ask them questions and to listen to the story, to look at the character, to role play. Um, you can find the virtual world, um, the virtually anywhere graphic novel. Um, let me see. Okay. Here, this is the link where you can go and look at the work that we did together. Working on the graphic novel, we had to decide if the, uh, the avatars were expressing what uh, they were supposed to express through the use of the language. So it was a challenge and it was fun to, to do this project. And, and it, once again, it helps students understand much better the, the, what they were learning. So thank you so much for your attention and well, hope that you can come and visit. So if you have any thank questions you. now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Peonia. Wonderful. Oh, so please make sure to, to click on, sorry. Make sure to click on, on the characters that are next to me here. Uh, they are uh, the professor, Gita and Paul, the characters of Virtually Anywhere. So you click them, they, you will receive a, a folder with information and the landmarks to go visit. So, okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Peonia. We are coming up on the hour, so I am going to do this fairly quickly. Um, I do have Kaylee's presentation that she has sent us. and. So I'm just going to read it right off of Speakeasy. So Kaylee's presentation today is called Chinese Island, Immersive Task-Based Language and Culture Learning in Second Life. Kaylee says the ideas for Chinese Island emerged from a practical problem faced by her students learning Chinese that she observed many years ago. It struck her that her third year students, despite having learned Chinese for at least three years and being able to read Chinese reasonably well, were seemingly unable to express themselves confidently or, co or coherently in spoken Chinese in an ad hoc situation. The problem was similar for her introductory level students, but that was not unexpected as they had much more limited exposure to hearing the language at that level. Kaylee personally spent about five years studying in China. During that time, her experience was that as she, she learned as much, if not more, outside the classroom than in it. Living in the language and cultural environment provided her with ample opportunity to use the language she was learning from a textbook in the classroom out in everyday life. While there were reasonably high costs to making mistakes, you know, particularly embarrassment, the ability to make mistakes and then go back and try it again the next day was an invaluable learning opportunity. Most of Kaylee's students, both at the introductory and third year level, were not from homes in which Chinese is spoken. So their, inter their contact with the language is limited to classroom interaction, after class assignments and tests. Moreover, while spending mo Time in a country where Mandarin is the everyday language would be desirable. This is not something that all students can do for various reasons, nor is it something that can be done during a university semester. There was another factor that influenced Kaylee's thinking about a solution to this lack of opportunity. The Chinese Studies program at Monash University has, for the last 20 years or more, run an intensive summer class at the end of each year where students can spend three or four weeks studying the curriculum in China. Students eat, live, study, play, sleep on the grounds immersed in the culture and the language. 
For six years, Kaylee traveled to China and stayed with the students for six weeks to provide pastoral care and administrative services. Every year, a proportion of the students would in inevitably become ill, sometimes more from hard play than from hard work, and they would need to see a doctor. To her surprise, even some of the students at more advanced levels would call her in the middle of the night and ask her to accompany them to the university medical clinic to see a doctor. Despite supposedly being able and at a one again, once again, despite supposedly being able and at a relatively advanced level of language learning, their unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with the process for seeing a doctor and the attendant vocabulary, in addition to being sick, meant that they were very stressed about having to deal with the situation on their own. As a result, when designing lessons, activities, and tasks for the virtual environment, Kaylee had two main focuses. The first is to utilize the topics, vocabulary, grammar, and cultural knowledge set out in the main textbook. The idea to keep things as relevant to what students were learning in the classroom as possible and to give them a chance to revise, practice, and consolidate that material in a different context. The second focus was to incorporate aspects of real life situations to a student or anyone else living in China that they would potentially encounter, thus creating the conditions for situated learning. On this basis, Kaylee wanted to create a virtual environment that included virtual versions of some of the places where these everyday activities would occur. Her goal was to have students actively using their language skills in this virtual environment. Kaylee closed her remarks by stating that she welcomes visitors to Chinese Island and so with that, thank, I want to thank Kaylee so much for offering this information to us. And she does have a video available that you can watch over at the Models of Teaching area. So we are at the top of the hour, and I was hoping we would have some time for questions. Um, I think what we'll go ahead and do is uh, wrap this up and then we can have a more informal time at the patio behind us. So first of all, thank you to all of our guests and um, please be thinking about your questions and we'll go ahead and address those here in just a second. I do have a couple of closing announcements. Of course, thanking all of our presenters today. The next VWEC Expert Series is on August 11th when we'll present another panel to discuss the working definition of the metaverse. This one should be fun. Also, Midori Linden will be joining us on Wednesday, August 2nd at 9 a.m. SLT right here. And she'll be bringing Obi Linden as well, so you won't want to miss this. Uh, there is a sign kind of right behind me that has some more information. And you can find this in all scheduled events at the VWEC Events Plaza calendar, both in-world and at our website, which is in chat. You can, uh, just as a reminder, the VWEC YouTube channel is also here in chat. And finally, if you're interested in you yourself presenting here at the WVE, VWEC Plaza, please fill out the form linked in chat. And if you would, go ahead and please join us in our conversation at the deck area. So that is right behind you. And thank you all so much for being here today.